can be an integration of work life and family life. It doesn't have to be separate. I think that's a false nomer. Corporations want people to leave their values at home when they go to work. If your family was there, it would be hard to do the kind of things that corporate employees are asked to do in terms of destroying the planet. Uh, there's just so many things. That's Judy Wicks, and this is the Powerful Ladies Podcast. I'm Cara Duffy, a business coach and entrepreneur on a mission to help you live your most extraordinary life by showing you anything is possible. People who have mastered freedom, ease, success, who are living their best lives and most ridiculous lives, and those who are changing the world are often people you've never heard of until now. I've shared before on this podcast that if someone inspires you, just reach out to them. You never know who will be a yes to hanging out with you. A client of mine recommended that I read the book, Good Morning, Beautiful Business. Within the first chapter, I knew I'd found a new woman to add to my podcast guest wish list and to my heroes list. Judy Wicks has a long list of accomplishments. She's a mom, an entrepreneur, a restaurateur, a multi nonprofit founder, an author, a speaker, an activist, a community builder, a connector, a world traveler, the list goes on. She created the first of many things in the restaurant and local food and local community movement. And it's amazing to me that everyone doesn't know who she is. Reading her book re-inspired me to take on doing it all and to be a louder voice in changing the world. When I grow up, I want to be Judy Wicks, and I think you will too. Welcome to the Powerful Ladies Podcast. Thank you. I am very honored that you are here today. Um, not only is it the, you know, we're talking during International Women's Month. Yesterday was International Women's Day. Um, but I just read your book. I have it right here. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> Good Morning, Beautiful Business. It was referred to me by a client. Uh, I'm a business coach and I, in addition to running powerful ladies, and she's like, you have to read this book. Like this, she, like she was so inspired by you. So she sent that book through and it's a book that knocked my socks off. Like, oh, wow. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. It completely gave me the new, like not even new, but the realignment that I didn't know I was needing to feel empowered to focus on doing more than I was. And so before I keep bragging about how great the book is, I'll (laughs) pause and let you introduce yourself to everyone. So please tell us your name, where you are in the world and what you're up to. Okay, Uh, my name is Judy Wicks. I I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, right in Center City. Uh, And I am a retired entrepreneur. I was in the restaurant business for uh, around 30 years. And uh, since my retirement, um, I wrote a book and um, uh, and then I started uh, two nonprofits. Uh, one is called the Circle of Aunts and Uncles, and it's a microloan fund for uh, emerging entrepreneurs in Philadelphia that are helping to build our local economy, mostly food and clothing businesses. Um, and then I have a second nonprofit called All Together Now Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, our mission is to connect rural and urban communities uh, to build um, sustainable and self-reliant um, r- regional supply chains um, so that we produce our basic needs as close to home as possible. Yeah. So I've been doing that as a volunteer for the last three years and now have just raised money to hire an executive director who starts on Monday morning. Congratulations. Thank you. And, and um, you know, you just listed a lot of amazing things and you are still very humble. <laughs> Because (laughs) for everyone who hasn't read your book yet, the book is called Good Morning, Beautiful Business. And you were such a pioneer and still are in how restaurants are run, in, you know, fair trade movement, in the local movement, in, you know, clean uh, poly farm um, produce direct to to, to restaurants and consumers. Um, You... um, and a previous husband started Free People, which um, growing up in Bucks County and then in Boston, like those stores were like, they made sense to me when I was younger, right? So 
you, you, I did not realize how much you had been influencing my whole life. And I don't think many people <laughs> do that all along the way that all these movements that you've been a part of, they came from you caring about your community and mm-hmm. they, they came from you also thinking about how can I be profitable and do the right thing, which t- like, I want everyone to be able to make those choices. So, <laughs> you know, did that, cho- did that come to you? Like, it just made sense to you, it seemed, in the book. And is that how it occurred in real life, too? Yeah. I never never once separated making profit from doing good. It was just came naturally to me. And I remember the day when I was on a panel uh, and an older uh, man on the same panel um, said that uh, he was advising the the, uh, young entrepreneurs um, on the in the session, um, that before they did good, they should do well. Um, yeah. <laughs> that they should uh, make sure that they have profits that they can then give away to charity or you know volunteer or whatever. And so I was kind of shocked at this, you know. And uh, I remember getting up and saying, "Well, I'm sorry, but I'm going to give you the opposite advice. That um, you know, making money in any way possible so that you can give away your excess at the end of the year or the end of your career." has caused most of the problems in the world um, Mm -hmm. and that we should never, ever separate making profit from doing good, that the two must go hand in hand, um, Mm -hmm. you know, if we want to have a world that works for everybody. Uh, Mm -hmm. So that was the first time that it actually even occurred to me (laughs) that people (laughs) purposely separate profit from doing good. You know, Mm -hmm. it just doesn't make any sense. Well, and and you're um, an entrepreneur that I think you know, isn't talked about a lot in the media because so often, even when I use the word entrepreneur, a lot of my clients are like, ew, I'm not an entrepreneur. And it's become this aligned with 10Xing and tech companies and globalized huge movements. Mm -hmm. And when I, you know, from reading your book, it was like, oh no, you, you just started because you wanted to build a community. Right. That's Mm -hmm. what I, uh, was always my, um, reason for doing anything ever since I was a little kid I, I I started little enterprises and you know started clubs or you know like the the, the you know the hiking club or the ex- explorers club or whatever but it was all, all everything I've always done is has really been about building community uh because mm-hmm. that's what makes me happy <laughs> yeah basically uh and uh yeah, so th- that's been uh, the motivation all, all along. Um, and, and then, you know, as I got into business, I realized what a powerful tool it is, that mm-hmm. um, it was in my business that I concentrated my creativity and my energy and my time, and that um, and, and realized that business uh, is a powerful tool uh, for social change. Um, and so then I started to focus on that, and how could I, um, uh, well, Someone joked one time that I wasn't really in the restaurant business. What I did was that I used good food to lure innocent customers into social activism. <laughs> uh, and so I think that's, in a sense, what I was doing, because I, I was never a chef, um, and um, I, but I just like to gather people. Um, and then I started realizing that I could, um, I could uh, get people interested in social change um, uh, by luring them <laughs> to the restaurant with good food. And so, good times. Yeah. And good times. Yep. I, I love that not only did you um, have great food and have great customers, you also and, and did activism, but you guys always had fun. Like all your parties you were talking about. I'm like, right. I, I need more parties in my business. Like that's a clear <laughs> ad. I have to make sure it comes yeah. back. Well, again, that just comes naturally to me. I, I, I had an older friend one time that said, Judy, you're such a social creature. If there's no one around, you'd share a nut with a squirrel. <laughs> That's yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I shared food with my dog plenty of times. <laughs> uh, yes. but yeah. Well, and I also um I loved that through doing what mattered to you, you just kept creating more opportunities. You know, there's so many people that uh we get so afraid to try something or do something, or we think about the limitations, but it seems that everything that you have, whenever you've trusted your gut and done, and maybe your heart and maybe both and said like, (laughs) no, we have to do this. It seemed to create a magnet of like more amazing people and things coming to you. Like, 
I think that's part of what was so inspiring about your story is, you know, how, what I struggle with is how can I do all of it? How can I, you know, have the business that is making the impact? How can I care about all the issues? And you just kept taking on more and more issues and building teams around it. And I'm like, okay, I just need to do what Judy does, like take on the <laughs> team. Yeah. Well, you know, one of my tricks, so to speak, um, uh, is living above the shop or was mm-hmm. living above the shop. And, and, and now I continue to work at, at home. I mean, with mm-hmm. COVID, you ha- kind of have to, but, yeah. um, you know, I never uh, had to uh, tend to two communities. I always lived and worked in the same community. I don't think necessarily someone has to live above the shop, but it really helps to live in the same place that you work in the same community. So you don't have two communities to engage in and pull, kind of pull yourself apart. And I think the too many people... Um, are so intent on separating work from from home that they are willing to um, commute, uh, and I, that takes so much time that when you think of the amount of time that people commute, th- that's the time that they could be using to do either fun things or meaningful things or both or whatever. Um, so that's one thing I I really strongly believe in is um, uh, is living and working in the same community, and I and I think that also is part of my localism, um, you know, a philosophy. Um, you know, when we really are knowledgeable about the place where we live and we take care of that place. And uh, I think we're such we're such mobile uh, people modern days that we're flying all over the place and we might work, you know, far from where we live or whatever. And um, so we don't really think about, you know, what does my community need? You know, where does my food come from? Where does my energy come from? Where does my waste go through to? And yeah. Do I know about these things? Are they being do- done right? How can I make them better? Um, so, um, yeah, it's all tied together. This commitment to place, I guess, is what it's all about uh, for me. And I've always been committed to place. You know, I grew up in a small town where I lived my whole life. Um, I went off to college, but then I moved to Philly in 1970. Uh, and that's been my place since then. Um Oh, and I, I just wanted to add a little something in terms of my first business uh, in 1970 when I came to Philadelphia uh, was called the Free People Store, but it wasn't um, it wasn't the predecessor of the current um, Free People. Um, it was the um, the first uh, Urban Outfitters uh, mm-hmm. because our the concept um, uh, it was to create uh, basically a, a general store for a certain demographic, which were the under 30 crowd, because only because we happen to be 23. Uh, and, and as far as, as, as starting a store, when I was little, I, I used to paint things on scraps of wood and sell them from my wagon down by the highway. And so when my first husband and I were trying to decide what to do, we were in Vista for a year and living in Eskimo village you know, during the Vietnam War. And when we came home and decided, you know, oh, we have to have a career, um, we couldn't uh, we couldn't figure out who we wanted to work. We didn't want to work for anybody, basically. So I said, let's start a store. Uh, and I said, you know, th- all you have to know is you buy something at one price and you sell it for a higher price. And uh, so my husband said, OK, well, let's try that. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, that's how we started. And we started with $3,000, which was our stipend from Vista. We each got $1,500. Um, and it's a, you know, billions of dollars a company now. Um, and my first husband is still the CEO. Uh, but I left to find my own ad- adventure. Um, that's a whole nother story that's, you know, from the book. Um, but, um, you know, the, uh, the, the concept of um, having a general store for all the things that a demographic needs, you know, mixing together the clothes, uh, housewares, records and books, house plants and all that kind of stuff was, was not heard of before. Um, it was like probably the first life, what they call now a lifestyle store. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so uh, it was original in that way. Um, and um, so I just wanted to, 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 to say that after I left uh, the store, the free, the free people store, uh, my husband changed the name uh, to Urban Outfitters. Um, and then years after that, he brought back the name Free People as a second store, which had a different, uh, a totally different um, um, business plan, business model. It was just a clothing store and and, and uh, kind of cheap clothing, quite frankly. But it was Urban Outfitters that was the uh, uh, what our store um, was the basis for, the foundational store. Yeah. And I, and it always made me happy. I I spent way too much time in both of them in Philly and in Boston. Um, (laughs) but it was one of the first places that also sold, um, new things and vintage things. 
And we did that in the first store as well. Mm -hmm. um, that was a big part of our business. We would go to the, the rag man um, and uh, he had these bins of clothes, of used clothes that were, you know, like 15 feet or, or even 20 feet high. They're in these, these bins. And so uh, Dick and I would crawl uh, into this big mound of clothing and start digging, you know, and say, oh, here's a fur coat. Oh, here's a leather jacket. Oh, here's a, a velvet dress. Oh, here's a silk slip, you know. Yeah. So we'd go through all these clothes, you know, trying to find the gems and then mm -hmm. bought them by the pound, which was really cheap because mm -hmm. the clothes are going to be shipped overseas just in bulk. You know, they didn't bother to sort them. Um, and so we picked out the gems and then had a tremendous uh, markup because we'd buy them by the pound, you know, it was like pennies um, and then charge, you know, $50 for the leather jacket or something. Um, so that was a big part of our success was selling carefully curated um, previously worn clothes. Um, and then at the same time, we, we had a free bin. So uh, when students uh, left, uh, they would leave clothes on our front steps and we put them in a free bin because we wanted everyone who came to the store to be able to afford something. And if they didn't have any money, they could go to the free bin <laughs> and, and find something for free. Well, it, there's so many things that I that yeah. my, my brain just like sparking right now of, of like things to keep talking about because, you know, having the the you know new products the the used products the free bin it's it's so interesting to me and i'm and i'm sure this is more clear in hindsight for you than in the moment but how you kept considering all the levels you know i talked to so many clients about making this a value ladder right how do you serve everyone at different places so that you can still serve the way you want to and make it accessible for different people and you know, before it was even in existence in a marketing structure at, at an MBA program, like you were just doing it because it made sense. Like you wanted to be able to say yes to anyone and, and to include everyone. And it's just more proof that all the, and not all, I would, I'm going to venture 90% of the business nonsense that people are taught and told that aligns with a, a profit first global economy orientation we don't need and we can throw it away and make our lemonade stand and everything will be fine. <laughs> I also love that you talked about living where you work, you know, on my grand ideas list that when I get in front of a senator, I'll bring up one is having a tax rebate if you work within certain miles of your um, office or, or place of work, because I agree with you. Like there's the number one cause of people to be unhappy is their commute time. And I've even spent time, uh, I've lived in, in the East Coast, I lived in, in Europe for a while, but when I moved to California, there was a period when I was driving to LA, downtown LA, oh, and wow. it was horrible. I did mm -hmm. it for about a year and I'm like, I'm, I'm killing myself, I'm killing the planet. Like this is so not, none of this is adding up. Yeah. And since I've been able to work from home as an entrepreneur, like everything has shifted because mm -hmm. like you said, you get all this time back. Like. I was not surprised, as I'm sure you were not either, when people were forced to be working from home, people who could, that their productivity went up. Right. And they probably were still in their pajamas all day and it was fine. <laughs> yeah, it's a, you know, COVID changed a lot. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's one of them when people spend time at home and they realize they don't want to commute, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and that they're, that, and I think importantly that there can be an integration of work life and family life. It doesn't have to be separate. Yes. I think that's a false nomer. Um, mm -hmm. And I, it, you know, why I feel like that's been promoted is they, that corporations want people to leave their values at home when they go to work. Um, and so, you know, if you were, if your family was there, it it would be hard to do the kind of things that corporate employees are asked to do in terms of. Um, mm -hmm you know, excluding others in, in terms of destroying the planet. Uh, there's just mm -hmm. so many things. And, you know, if you, uh, you know, if you uh, bring your values to work, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very, it would be a very different uh, planet. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that's part of, of separating people from their values is separating work and family. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, you know, when you work at home, your, your family's right there. And so you tend to talk about your work more, um, you know, for me uh, in the restaurant business, my kids were more integrated into the business. They were down there. They they saw what I was doing. My my daughter, who's now forty two, 
uh, once told me that it was by watching me, at, you know, uh, at work that she learned how to um, value customers. Uh, and she's great at community, uh, at uh, customer service in her business. And um, she once told me that she learned that from me by watching me <laughs> from when she was five years old and, uh, you know, being in the restaurant with me. Well, and it's a much more natural way, even just anthropologically, right, yeah. of everyone being together. The farm um, family, you know, mm -hmm. the the old time businesses, whether it was a, a grocery store or um, a tailor shop or whatever, the family lived upstairs. And so the family was integrated, you know, into the hardware store or whatever it was. And kids worked in their parents' stores and whatnot. Um, you know, and I and I feel like things are are uh, hopefully going back more that way where we feel uh, an integration of family and 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 uh, work life uh, and 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 the values and it, 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 having the same values in both. Yeah, it, it, it's my uh, coaching journey started helping people with nonprofits because it broke my heart how many start and fail. Because usually someone shows up and says, "I want to save puppies," and then doesn't know how to use a spreadsheet, <laughs> right? And, <laughs> and then I, similar to you, realizing that there could be that business had power and like being able to make it work meant that we could do the good thing. Um, so I, I really relate to like hoping that more of these small businesses and people doing more of what aligns with their heart can keep happening. Yeah. Um, you know, reading your book, I started going down a rabbit hole at Chelsea Green Press of like, okay, who <laughs> give me more people like Judy, please. Um, <laughs> and then I moved on to this book, um, Local is Our Future. Uh-huh. And I'd love to spend some time talking about that because I, you've been such an influence in the local movement. And I don't think, I don't think people realize that, uh, how much the, the myth and narrative of globalization has kind of seeped into everything and how much of a negative impact it's really having on our communities and our economy. So if you could speak to that, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the thing about I'm not against um, all global trade. You know, mm -hmm. um, my vision is that the global economy um, uh, be a, a network of sustainable and just uh, regional economies um, mm -hmm. so that rather than having the global economy be controlled by large multinational corporations who are basically draining uh, wealth uh, mm -hmm. from our communities, um, and becoming super rich um, and controlling everything, uh, that we decentralize um, our economy uh, to produce our basic needs as close to home as possible through local farms and local small businesses. Um, and in doing so, um, we accomplish quite a lot. Uh, first of all, we're moving wealth and power away from these large corporations uh, to our own communities. But secondly, we're, we're, we're developing self-reliance. And in, in this time of climate change, um, this is extremely important because we see now how global supply chains are being disrupted. Uh, during the pandemic, um, a lot of people couldn't get food. They'd go into the grocery store and the, the shelves would be empty um, because the, the, the centralized, in this case, just a national, nationally uh, centralized food system um, was imploding and the farmers were pouring milk down the drain or slaughtering all their pigs or whatever because the, the supply chains broke down. Meanwhile, the local farmers were, you know, pivoting um, and getting food into town. Um, and, um, you know, so we saw it firsthand during the pandemic. And then um, we saw it uh, more recently how the global supply chains were breaking down. Still, they're broken down. I mean, there are a lot of things aren't coming through or they're coming through very slowly. And, you know, it just makes sense that this is going to get worse. As weather gets worse, it's going to disrupt uh, transportation. Uh, as We're not done with pandemics yet. Um, we saw how that disrupted. Uh, there's cyber warfare. Um, just recently, you know, a few months ago, a, 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 a big conglomerate uh, beef industry was attacked by uh, uh, cyber warfare and they couldn't move the, the beef along the supply chain. And uh, is a huge disruption. And so these these big companies are targets for cyber warfare uh, or terrorism, you know. Um, and, you know, the more we decentralize, the, the, the less it is to disrupt. Um, and the more nimble local systems are that they can pivot 
um, where the big uh, systems uh, are too big to move quickly and, and, and recalibrate. So what I feel is that the work we're doing now to build local self-reliance so that we have access locally to our food, to our clothing, to our <laughs> energy, um, to our plant medicines, to our building materials, the more we can shore up that self-reliant regional economy, uh, the the better prepared our, our our children and grandchildren will be to survive climate change. Because we're not leaving them a healthy planet, unfortunately. We're leaving them uh, in crisis. Um, and the least we can be doing um, is developing an economy that can support them. Um, and yet, you know, people aren't even thinking about it. They're going, uh, for the most part, along their merry way, buying stuff from China, and not really thinking, you know, where does my food come from or where does my energy come from? Where does my clothes come from? Whatever. So it's a big educational um, jump uh, for people to uh, get on the bandwagon about this um, and time to make a difference uh, because local economies not only uh, reduce the amount of carbon of this long distance shipping, but we're also preparing our, our communities, um, you know, to face uh, the effects of climate change. Well, it's, it's almost like... Um coming back to what we know has has worked, right? And again, both anthropo anthropologically and, it can, and economically, you know, it's that kind of frontier mindset of like, okay, what does the town need to survive? You know, we- Yeah, and, and, yeah. and then and we have modern modern technology to help us this time, which which, mm -hmm. which didn't exist before. So I'm not saying like give up all the modern stuff. I mean, because no. technology um, and our, our ability to communicate and and whatnot to to ele electronically, like we're doing right now with the Zoom, is so important. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm not. It's not like going back to the caveman uh, stages or colonial days or whatever. Um, but it's it's a, it's about common sense, you know. Mm -hmm. And 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 I think an intuitive um, a, a drive for self reliance. I th I think that the, the seeing people go to the farmers markets, um, there's there's reason for that uh like why why are why are farmers markets so, so popular well i think one is that they're fun you actually get to meet your 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 neighbors and your and your and the farmers who bring your food into town each mm -hmm. each week but there's also something about uh intuitively feeling that it's right um and i think that comes from um our intuition about self-reliance that it, as we and when we buy from local farmers and help to build their businesses we're securing our our own food security um, and so I think, you know, we now need to do that with other things, you know, with energy and clothing and building materials and plant medicines and so on. Like, how can mm -hmm. we shift our uh, buying away from the pharmaceuticals uh, to learning how to use locally raised plant medicine? And that's happening now with the legalization of um, CBD and, and mm -hmm. THC. Um, and there's other plant medicines that are not as familiar to people that are, are gradually be going to be uh, recognized um, and, uh, and legalized. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Like, yes, 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 is how I feel. I'm like, can I nod any more during this conversation? Um, well, and, and there's, a, there's a book that my dad gave me years ago called Bowling Alone about the shift in communities from post-World War II to, I think this book was written in the 90s, so, or early 2000s, so just about how so much of the disconnection that's happened within communities and honestly, the craving people have to be a part of something. Yeah. You know, I, um, my nerdy, I did my thesis in college on new urbanism. And there's a great book, Suburban Nation out there, but it, it talks about how, as you said, all of these parts are coming together for mm -hmm. people who don't know, right? Like why we just feel we're drawn to communities where you can mm -hmm. walk and where you do have um, small businesses and where everything isn't a chain because you there's there's soul there's people there's interaction and mm -hmm. the things that we want as humans and uh, I feel I keep choosing places to live that have walkability scores and have that because I know I need it <laughs> to be yeah. healthy um, but I think anyone listening can feel the difference of walking into a chain restaurant versus walking into a family-owned restaurant right away right um, exactly and same with a store you know, mm -hmm. yeah, it's 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 um, we want to be connected, and whether it it is on Zoom or if it you know ideally it's in real life where we can hug people and high five and sit down and have a cup of coffee together because um, we I think so many people are missing that and craving it and they were even before the pandemic because of 
how their yeah. actual community is structured. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Jane Jacobs um, is a hero of mine, and she was, you know, the founder of this idea of the new urban, urban urbanism uh, of walkable communities. And she talked about the sidewalk ballet, you know, in cities of just watching the people go by and so on and the joy that brings and uh, how the demolition of, of urban communities and building these high rises um, destroyed community. Mm -hmm. um, so she was a great, um, I really admire, admire her. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, and, and in terms of uh, individualism versus community, that mm -hmm. is something that is so important that Americans have been really geared towards individualism, that we look up to the the lone cowboy, you know, or whatever, you know. Um, and um, I think capitalism um, is really about individualism. It's about individual achievement. It is about, you know, dominating and winning and um, at the expense of others. And that there's only so much to go around and you have to fight for your own and all this kind of stuff that's really caused the a lot of the crisis that we're in right now, uh, both in terms of the uh, inequality of our societies and as, in terms of our relationship with the environment. So we really need to move from individualism to community uh, that I don't, I feel, my feeling is that he, the human species is at a crossroads right now. I think we all see this. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's always constant change. And, and the question is, which direction is the change going? Um, and for billions of years, you know, life was unfolding, you know, to become mm -hmm. more beautiful, more diverse, um, more complex. Um, and, you know, human beings have now disrupted that. You know, nature constantly creates the conditions for more life. And that's what's been going on for billions of years. And now human beings are doing the opposite. We're creating conditions for less life. And so the planet is dying, you know, mm -hmm. under our... Um, the effects of human beings. Uh, we're getting mass extinction. Uh, our resources are being polluted. Our water, our air, our water um, with toxic chemicals. Um, we're getting more and more cancer, all these things. So we're creating, uh, we're, the, the planet is dying. So we either continue that path um, towards our own extinction, um, which would not be all that bad, except that we we would bring with us all the innocent mammals and the innocent people <laughs> you know, with us, um, or we can or we can start heading in the in the other direction, um, which is uh, an upward direction. Uh, and the way to get there is to move from individualism to community, um, mm -hmm. to move um, from hoarding uh, to sharing, uh, mm -hmm. to move from fear of not having enough for ourselves to sharing, to generosity, um, that this is the only way out of this. This is the only way that human beings are going to survive if we raise our consciousness to start um, acting in these ways with these values, um, to be um, to have a revolution of values, as Martin Luther yeah. King called for back in the 60s, where we move from a thing-oriented society to a people-oriented society. And that's what is called for now. And the, the price for not doing so is extinction. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's every reason uh, why uh, we need to change uh, our values uh, and our and therefore our economy um, if we care at all um, about our children and grandchildren. I had the pr privilege yesterday of hosting a panel of women who, like you, are are putting everything they care about into how they spend their day and do their business. Um, we had a, an expert who in reproductive rights, a Dr. Sophia Yen, who started a um, subscription, like birth control company. We uh, had a woman who focuses on rehabilitating people from jails back into society. Uh, someone who's all about, you know, voting rights and access and someone who's also uh, brings together the Latina community. And we kept coming to this space of um, everything that's on the ballot, everything that's a social or political or even economic factor uh, seems to impact women so much more than it's impacting our male counterparts right now based on how society has been set up. And it seems it seemed that way in the sense of who else is making the choices about food in a family or where the kids go to school or which the, where the doctor is. And um, if something breaks down, like we saw in the pandemic, there was a record number of women having to quit their jobs uh, to then make a choice. Cause you, as you mentioned, everything was disconnected. So it couldn't keep all existing together. How do you feel 
you know, being the powerful lady that you are, how do you feel that um, feminism has intertwined with the all the issues that continue to be unsolved, it seems? And do you feel like there's a new wave of women understanding that and taking actions again? Or do you feel like you're seeing uh, a repeat of what's happened before? Interesting question. I do feel that a feminine energy uh, is a huge factor um, in this. Um, and, you know, it, it's, and I say feminine energy not being only within women, although mm -hmm. we, uh, we have the, the uh, good fortune <laughs> of being raised as women and therefore as nurturers and 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 the one that's most responsible for uh, dealing with the children um and food and all these things and so we're more in a position um to um to be generous and nurturing and loving um because we've been culturally groomed for that where men haven't but i feel that the uh, the feminine energy within men um is equally as important as the feminine energy within women so that we as individuals need to be have a balance of feminine and masculine energies um and uh, you know i had a farmer one time um uh, that um uh, explained it that good farming was a balance of masculine and, and feminine energy that the masculine energy was more about efficiency and the feminine energy was more about nurturing and you need to have both um if you uh, if you have uh, too much male energy uh, you you might have a successful uh farm but you're not going to have the best tomatoes or the best chickens because you don't have enough nurturing on the other hand if you have too much feminine energy and not enough masculine, you might have happy chickens and beautiful tomatoes, but you're going to go out of business <laughs> because you're, you're, you're not looking at the efficiency of how you're spending your time. So it's that balance. Um, and unfortunately, our economy is totally out of balance. Um, you look at the food system and the, the, the horrific conditions of, um, again, all the females, the mother hens, the mother pigs, the mother cows are so abused in our food system. You know, a lot of people don't understand that milk comes from pregnant cows and um, we artificially inseminate the cows, take their babies away immediately and either kill them or, or bottle feed them to be uh, dairy cows. And then we humans drink the milk that was meant for the babies. Um, that's an atrocity. Uh, the way the mother hens are kept in these tiny cages, the way the mm -hmm. mother pigs are kept, um, you know, it, it, again, in these tiny cages where they can't even turn around. And these are animals that are as smart as a three-year-old child, smarter than our dogs, more affectionate. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's, it's just horrific. Uh, it's been a big motivator for me, you know, to change our food system and the way we, mm -hmm. because of the way we treat farm animals. But long story short, um, there's no nurturing uh, in the industrial food system. It's all about efficiency. It's all about masculine energy. Um, we need to we need a balance. Um, and the, I believe that we're destroying the world because feminine energy has been repressed. Um, that we need to, uh, to to lift up feminine energy to come into balance with the masculine. And I think that you know uh, that women, for the large part, are are, are doing that. Um, I heard someone say uh, that some wise person said that it's going to be women that save the world, you know, and I, you know, I think that there's some truth in that, in that I think that, that, that women do care or, or not that they care more, but they see more about the future of children and what we need to do in terms of climate change. Uh, but I, I don't want to diminish the important role of men. It's, it's really, it's really about bringing feminine energy into both um, uh, men and women um, and therefore into our world and into our economy. Um, to to do away with these things that where there's no love and no nurturing like like the animal factories um, and you know uh, you can name so many different parts of our economy um, where people are abused um, you know where there's the chocolate industry or the diamond industry I mean there's probably almost every, across the oil industry how we're destroying the Amazon um, it's just unbelievable uh, when everything is about efficiency and profit uh, as opposed to nurturing and love. Um, so we have to, if we're, we want to survive, <laughs> we have to bring in more feminine energy, more love, more nurturing, more generosity, more community. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned Jane Jacobson before. Who are other powerful humans that have inspired you along your journey and helped you to get to where you are today? I'd say the two, uh, the two 
most that I think about are Gandhi <laughs> and Martin Luther King. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, both males, uh, but yeah. males with a lot of feminine energy, with a healthy balance of masculine <laughs> and feminine uh, energy. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think Gandhi, well, Gandhi was really the the, um, the 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 first to call for local economies. Um, you know, he would say to the Indian uh, people, "Stop wearing those clothes that are made in Great Britain." Uh, we grow the flax uh, for the linen. Um, so uh, you always saw him with a spinning wheel because he was making his own clothes. He said, let's burn up all those English made clothes. Let's, let's, uh, let's, um, let's take those raw products of the flax and turn it into linen ourselves, make our own clothes because that will bring us back power. Uh, he said the same thing about food, grow the community gardens. Um, so he, he was the one that saw that local self-reliance uh, had power and that if they were gonna throw off the English that they needed to be self-reliant. And that's where we are now, to throw off a corporate rule over our lives. Uh, we have to become self-reliant in our basic needs. And so I, pa I pattern this after Gandhi. Um, and Dr. King, um, I often refer to his revolution of values because he he saw that that was what was needed. The, the foundation um, for our survival had to be uh, in a shift in values. Uh, or it's going to go down in, uh, towards destruction. Um, mm -hmm. So those are the two that I look to the most in terms of, uh, I, I, you know, around Martin Luther King Day, I take that opportunity. We used to have a, a Martin Luther King Day a dinner at the White Dog every year, um, but I was always took that time to reread his speeches and listen to his tapes and so on, because they're so inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, so those, those two more than anyone <laughs> are my heroes. You know, with all the work that you continue to do, uh, what are you excited about for 2022 and what are you creating next? Well, I'm most excited for 2022 about um, my, 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 the two nonprofits that I'm working with now. And all together now, we, we just raised enough money to hire an executive director. As I mentioned, it, she's starting on mm -hmm. Monday. So I'm really excited about this next chapter for our nonprofit that I'll have somebody uh, you know, uh, uh, to work with in, in partnership as the founder board chair and uh, as the executive director. Um, and she's a very values led um, woman. Uh, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to working with her um, in this next uh, phase and to, um, you know, um, begin doing even more than we're doing. Basically, at all together now, we're, we have two big buckets. One is the bucket of, um, of supply. How can we increase the supply of local products by working with the farmers and the entrepreneurs? And the other bucket is in demand. How can we increase the demand for local products by educating the public about what the situation is that we're in and how they can get access to uh, local products? Um, and so uh, there's just so many ways in which we could do this work. And I'm yeah. just excited to get to it. We're all, already planning our events for 2022. Now that COVID has subsided, at least for, for, for now, um, we can be in person again. And so we're planning all these tours. We're planning like a, a grain tour, you know, go to, to grain farmers um, and then to a mill and then see how local grain is used to make bread, to make beer, to make um, gin and other <laughs> distill distilled uh, liquors, um, to make empanadas and noodles and whatnot. Um, so having people understand these supply chains and to actually go on mm -hmm. tours to see them. Um, and why should we... By, when we're looking at what, what beer should we choose, we should choose the one that buys local grains, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and same with our distilled uh, our liquors <laughs> and uh, as well as our food and our meat for people to understand the, uh, the hor hor horrific conditions of factory farms and how it's, um, it, it's poisoning our environment um, and, and it's so brutal to the animals, how we have to stop, we have to shut them down and we have to support uh, a, a diversified um, you know, pastured animal um, uh, husbandry system, mm -hmm. um, you know, with free range chickens and pastured pork and grass fed beef, all those things. And so I'm really excited about, these are passions of mine personally, and, and I, I'm, I, I'm excited about uh, uh, developing programs in these areas uh, in the nonprofit work I'm doing to, to spread these ideas further um, and to have collective joy uh, in, in the work we do together. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and so many people get stuck, right? And thinking at their huge list, like it occurs to me as a scroll that like hits the floor and keeps going down the hallway <laughs> of things that need to be fixed or repaired or just out of integrity in, in the world. And, you know, I think, you know, talking about food is one of the easiest areas to make that shift. Um, 
you know, it's part of why I've chosen to be vegetarian because I, I, I can't be eating out of integrity. I just, I can't like it's, I don't know where it's coming from. So at least I can trust that spinach is going to be safer Mm -hmm. because it's, it's, you know, it's not okay. Like how things are treated is not okay. Um, how do you recommend people start to take an inventory in their business and in their life to start realigning with the values that they have? Well, I, I think, first of all, to uh, explore where things come from. I mean, take food, for instance. Um, once I found out about the factory farming of, of animals, um, I stopped eating meat unless I know what farm it comes from. Mm-hmm. Um, now I'm not, um, against killing animals to eat. I know some people are, and I respect that. Um, and, but I, I am against, um, the, the disrespect, uh, and the mistreatment and the torture of animals. Um, you know, I feel that humans uh, that uh, at least I feel I I am a a carnivore, (laughs) um, you know, I, I, I have tried being a, a vegetarian and a vegan at different times of my life. And I, and I felt, uh, um, unhealthy but uh, everybody's different everybody's chemistry is different so we're you know and it's you know something we're born with part of the world we came from or whatever uh but i think we should eat much less meat that meat should be a special occasion um and that we should honor uh the animal who gave his life uh, for us and we should make sure that that animal came from a farm uh, that respected the animal as well um and there there are th- such things as as gentle slaughter um you know where an animal is just uh, you know shot between the eyes and never know what's coming and that they're not transported long distance you know mm-hmm. and so on and i um i mean i wouldn't mind going that way when my time came <laughs> uh, uh being on a truck going hundreds of miles and then in a slaughter all that oh my god so scary. i think it, it's scary um so I think there is a right and a wrong way, uh, you know, to um, to eat meat. Um, so I think that's the first thing people should do is to find out where their meat comes. If they don't know where it comes from, I would not eat it for many reasons. Um, a meat is from factory farms is a it's full of uh, hormones. Uh, they say that young girls are getting a breast um, too early because of the hormones that are in milk that are making the cow produce uh, more milk. Um, there's all kinds of repercussions, antibiotics that's in meat. Uh, factory farms um, feed antibiotics to animals continuously because they're so crowded they would get infected all the time. Well, that antibiotic is in the meat and we're eating it. And so we're becoming um, uh, resistant. Uh, uh, you know, there's super bugs that are resistant to antibiotics, you know, because of this. So that's a real danger. Um, um, and there's, you know, there's just a million reasons why not to eat um, meat from factory farms. Um, uh, they're for our health, for the health of the planet and for the health of the animal. Um, uh, but, you know, energy, take energy. So people should ask, okay, well, uh, okay, here's where my food comes from. Where does my energy come from? Uh, mm-hmm. Is it from fossil fuels? Uh, if so, change it. Um, like I just found out about the danger, uh, dangers and the, really the atrocities of, of, of fracking, uh, fracking for natural gas in Pennsylvania. And I'm sure that happens in some of the states where your viewers are living. But um, uh, frac gas is really, really destructive to the environment, to the communities where it's extracted, to the communities where the pipelines come through. Uh, I was arrested for shutting down a drill rig where a pipe was coming through uh, a farm country, um, and uh, we we put up a fight to try and stop it. But um, you know, I, I think that um, uh, so when I found out about all this and I realized that I was using natural gas. Um, I decided to electrify my house, so I I I, I changed my um, my appliances to be all electric. I put solar on my roof, and I changed the supplier in in, in my um, in the grid. You know where I, I get my electricity through the grid. You can change your supplier to a, in most places to a third party that um, that's in my case 100% solar. So the, the so I don't not that the electrons are kept separate, but they're all mixed together. But my dollars only go to pay a solar company for the electricity that I use that supplements the solar on my roof. Um, and all my appliances are electric, including my my stove. I thought, oh my god, I have to cook on an electric stove. How horrible! Well, I found out there's something called induction cooking. Um, so it's it's uh, electric, but it works um, in a, 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 through magnets. I, I won't go into the whole whole process now, but it's the most efficient way to cook. It, it uses the l- least energy, and you have a great deal of control, which is what you're usually 
lose when you have mm-hmm. an electric stove. Um, it's it's very detailed amount of control. Um, you can boil water really really quickly. You can um, control the temperature uh, really easily. So anyway, so that's one thing I, I, I suggest to people that they electrify their houses and that they uh, make sure that their source uh, for their electricity uh, comes from renewable sources. And so I just go through the list. Where do where do my clothes come from? Are they coming from you know um, the sweatshops in China, or um, are, are my clothes being made in in Philadelphia by local designers and 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 local small scale manufacturers? Um, and this is an industry that's growing in all these basic needs. Um, so I think those are the questions we should ask. Where does my food come from? Where does my energy come from? Where does my waste go to? You know, are you recycling? Are you composting? We need to get the nutrients from our food waste back to the farms, you know, uh, through composting. That can be done in a number of different ways in different cities, depending where you live. But these are the things we need to be looking at um, to reduce reducing our waste as well as, you know, a purchasing in a wise way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's. um the part of what I loved about your book was being going from feeling um, disenfranchised to being brought back into it and like, no, 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 no. If Judy can do it, we can all do it. Like cut it out. Right. Cause sometimes the hardest thing is having a company called powerful ladies. Cause there are days <laughs> I don't want to be powerful. And it was like, no, 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 no. Like this is what it's for. Let's come back to these conversations. Let's come back to, reminding everyone that it's not as hard as it feels and it's not as hard as um, a lot of other sources are telling you that it is, which I think is yeah. the the key piece to remember, both for changing the world and for having a successful business. It's, it's not easy, but it's not as hard as they're making it sound. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I, I love that you say powerful ladies, because I think one of the problems for us as women is that we, sometimes we add abdicate we abdicate our power um and um you know and i do it um you know and i also at times um uh shrink from it you know um that we need to step into our power uh and i am still working on that i'm 75 years old um and you know you've read my book i've done a million things and so on but i still suffer from this from a childhood where i was discriminated against for being a girl okay mm-hmm. girls you can't do that because you're a girl you can't play baseball you can't take shop you know so i was so disheartened because these are the things i i love to do baseball and building and i couldn't do either because i was a girl and i and i bought into that uh, message that you're second class because you're a girl so get out of the way um and that still haunts me you know um i have to confront that and say no uh, girls are powerful <laughs> you know there's no reason why you should retreat because you're a girl you know, mm-hmm. step into your power and don't forget that you have it. Um, and because it's, it's, it's a hard thing to keep that up. <laughs> well, I think you'll appreciate that when I moved from Bucks County to Allentown, I moved in the middle of a school year and I got put into a shop class. I was the only girl. Oh, and great. And I got an A and then I was used to shame all the other guys in the class. Of like, if she's getting an A, why aren't you? And I was like, hey, that's still discrimination. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but I, we put some points back on the board for you there, I think. Um, you know, we ask everyone, what, what does powerful and ladies mean to them? And do the definitions of those words separately change when those two words are put next to each other? Powerful women, powerful ladies. Um, yeah. What does powerful mean to you? What is ladies? And if it's powerful ladies, does it change? Um, well, uh, uh, power to me means uh, uh, actualizing ourselves, uh, actualizing ourselves to, uh, to, 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 to accomplish something that we set our mind to. Um, and, and the combination of powerful ladies uh, to me is about uh, something I spoke to earlier, which is bringing feminine power uh, mm-hmm. into being. Um, and 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 into balancing it with masculine power, um, and we're not there yet as as a uh, as a society in the United States or in the world. Uh, we have not yet balanced um, uh, feminine power with with the masculine, and that's what's destroying us. So it is so important that we that we uh, bring more feminine power, you know, into mm-hmm. our lives uh, as women and and, and men both. Um, so. I think it's a a really important uh, concept. So I'm glad you show that. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> My pleasure. Um, we also ask everyone where they put themselves on the powerful lady scale. If zero is average everyday human and 10 is the most powerful lady you can imagine, where would you put yourself today and where would you put yourself on average? Uh, that's a hard question to answer. Um, maybe seven or eight. Um, and um, average over my lifetime, <laughs> it's hard to say, but uh, five or six. I don't, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I mean, as I said, I, I'm, I'm still, uh, I'm still learning how to step into my power. Uh, so it's, it's a lifelong journey of, of, um, of reaching one's full potential. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it's such a great reminder for everyone listening because you know, this question is one of the most controversial questions I ask. <laughs> and I think at some point I need to give it to a psychology team to go take and do some data with it. Um, but so many people, when I've asked them and how Powerful Ladies started, was women saying, I'm not. Mm. I, I, I can't be on the show. I'm not. And <laughs> I'm like, no, but I'm calling you. If I'm calling you, you are. Like, you've already been defined. I, I have I have knighted you. Like, <laughs> uh, right, right, right. And, and um, it's so interesting for me, like so many people get stuck in, I'm not there yet. And for someone as accomplished as you, um, you know, we can, we can make a very long scroll of all the things that you <laughs> have done and seen and achieved and stood for. And to see that you are the type of personality that's still working and you're like, no, I'm not cooked yet. We got more to do. <laughs> right, right, right. Like it's, it, I hope people hear that is really inspiring because, um, yeah, like you, I want to keep cooking and I want to make sure that, you know, it's it should be the game of how do we keep ever expanding versus yeah. achieving the summit and be like, okay, now I'll just, you know, float in the pool for the rest of my life. And you're like, what? How could you go back to that after you've seen the summit? Like, no, 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 no. There's another right. mountain. We got to keep going. Exactly. I, I don't mm -hmm. understand that, especially in this time of crisis, mm -hmm. uh, how people can just go lie on a beach somewhere. I mean, I mean, it's fine to go on vacation, but I mean, as a... Yeah as a full-time occupation, <laughs> you know. uh, yeah. but you know, I have to mention like one little thing that's helped me recently. And that is the whole concept of self-care. Like, you know, for most of my life as a, um, an entrepreneur, I, I always said, well, self-care is for sissies. You know, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a doer. I'm out there. Like who cares about self-care? That's like selfish or something, but it's really been in the, uh, during COVID where I, I was forced to slow down, um, and be a witness of my life in a sense. Um, more, more closely my personal life in a sense that I realized that I wasn't taking care of myself to the point where I was thinking like, do I, do I need to retire? Um, am I going to kill myself by the work I'm doing and need to retire? And I realized that, no, I, I don't. If I take care of myself, mm -hmm. uh, I can keep working. Um, and so that was a big discovery for me, you know, to, to slow, to allow myself to slow down a little bit. Like when someone asked me to do something, I'll say, well, I can't do it on this day because I have this on my schedule. Oh, oh I can do it on this day. Where in the old days, I would cross, crowd as many things as I could into one day and just go boom, 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 boom. You know, and I, and I love that exhilaration of, of, of doing things and doing them quickly and so on. But now I'm learning to slow down more uh, and take care of myself, partly because I'm 75 and it's really called for. But I wish in some ways that I had slowed down earlier because I think I missed a lot of life by going too fast, by always doing stuff rather than just simply being, you know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, uh, someone said, you should just take a bath more often and relax. And I thought, oh, baths, I mean, that's a waste of time. Now, you know, if I'm feeling anxious or something, I'll think, I am going to take a bath. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Uh, and so anyway, I just want to put out that message um, that self-care is not for sissies, uh, that we need to take care of ourselves so that we can continue to care for the planet um, and each other. Yeah, love that. Um, what would you like to leave everyone listening with today? Well, you know, I hope that people do think about the crisis that human species is in right now. Uh, and that we do have to raise our consciousness. So if we can model, um, you know, a, a life that uh, where we we are driven by heart, where we I make my most dis uh, important decisions from my heart as opposed to my head. Um, you know, it's not about figuring out in your mind what's the right thing to do. It's about feeling it in your heart. 
So we need to be uh, heart driven. Um, and when we're heart driven, um, we, we tend to naturally be more generous, um, more in, in cooperation and partnership than competition. Um, and, you know, to be more in community rather than individualism. Um, so I would say to, you know, to lead with your heart. <laughs> where can everyone who's now uh, a new Judy Wicks fan, where can they find you, follow you and support you and your organizations? Okay, well, there's a couple of different places. First of all, I have a personal website, judywicks.com. Uh, and that actually links to my projects um, uh, and to my book. If they wanted to order a book, they can order it uh, fr from my website or a bookstore. Uh, but then my two um, nonprofits uh, have their own websites, um, All Together Now PA, standing for Pennsylvania, altogethernowpa.org. Um, and the other one is the Microloan Fund, which is a Circle of Ants and uncles.com um and that's a really cool project circle events and uncles that could be replicated in another community it's a micro loan fund so those are my suggestions for keeping in touch with me and i am uh planning to write a sequel um to um good morning beautiful business about the work i'm doing now about local self-reliance uh in, uh, in a, a more um an updated version uh, so I don't know when that's going to be coming out uh, because I haven't started to write it yet. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm hoping in a, in, a, in a year or two to have another book out there. Well, um, when it's ready, you let me know. We'll have you back. We can talk all about it. Um, <laughs> you know, just thank you so much for being the trailblazer that you are and inspiring me and being a yes. This is another example for everyone listening. I've said it over and over in other episodes, but... When you reach out to the people who inspire you, you never know who will say yes. So thank you for the impact that you've made on me. Well, thank you for inviting me. I really enjoyed your show. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs>